Hello. And welcome to Inverness Christian Fellowship. My name's Robbie. And I'm Karen. And together we want to welcome you to our service today. We trust and pray that wherever you are, you may know God's blessing and that you would know the presence of his Holy Spirit right where you are. Later on in the service, we are going to be taking and sharing communion together. So I would encourage you, if you're maybe not organised for that, then take some time now to get yourself some juice, a, a, a piece of bread or a cracker, uh, so that when we come to communion, uh, you can join with us as we remember Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. We want to also say thank you to everyone that is involved in putting these services together. There is a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes, people doing recordings, people joining all the dots together, editing. And so we just want to say thank you to everybody that's involved in doing that for us. Karen is going to read for us. I just want to read Psalm 46. It's really blessed me this week and I just wanted to share it with you. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength and ever present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Let's worship him together. He is with us.
bearing shame and scoffing rude. In my place, condemned, he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Thank you, Lord. We're just going to take a few moments now just to reflect and, and thank the Lord for what he has done for us on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for the body that was broken, your body that was broken for us, for your blood that was shed. So although we're not together in one room, we are together united in one spirit together as we share communion, as we thank Jesus for his body that was broken for us just now. Father, for sending your Son. Jesus, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. Thank you that you died on that cross for us. And as we now take the, the cup and we remember your blood that was shed, for if there was no shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sin. And we thank you for that blood that was shed on the cross for us. Thank you, Jesus. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Let's sing that song together. We can have life in him. God sent his son.
Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we, we thank you for your unfailing love. We thank you that you care for us and have a good plan for our lives. We thank you for all your promises. The promise that you will never leave us or forsake us. The promise that you will be with us always, even to the end of the age. And we thank you, Father, that you are indeed an ever-present help in times of need. We thank you that the way has been opened up for us to come into your presence. And we thank you that you encourage us to do so. To come to you freely and with confidence and with reverence in our hearts. We understand, Lord, that your kingdom is coming. 
We understand that we belong to you, that we are your treasured possession, your children, redeemed through the precious blood of Christ. And Father, we come together this morning in your name. We are gathering in this way because of you. And we come to you in order to delight ourselves in you, to rejoice in your presence, to remember all of your good gifts and all of your faithful promises. Father, we want to honour you and to lift up your name here this morning. Draw near to us, we pray. And make your presence felt amongst us. Lord, meet with us at our point of need, we pray. These are strange and difficult times. Please help us to understand the times we're living through. Please help us to remember that you are in control. That you know the end from the beginning that you are God with us, that you are for us and not against us. Father, we thank you even for the strangeness of these times, that we have, many of us, have opportunity to reflect deeply, to turn our thoughts and affections towards you. And we pray for those in the front line working much harder than usual, and we pray that you will strengthen them and comfort them. We pray, Father, for those amongst us who are in distress, who may feel profoundly alone and disorientated. Women alone with their children, people shut up in confined spaces. And we pray that you, Father, our Father and our God, will care for them and meet their needs. Father, we thank you for your word and for the privilege of being able to gather and to be able to listen together and learn together. We thank you for Robbie who spends time thinking about us and praying for us, who spends time in your word trying to discern what you would say to us. And we pray that you will take the words that he brings to us this morning and that you will anoint them and that you will bring your supernatural authority to bear upon us as we listen attentively to your word. Please, Father, grant us living words, words that change us, that help us to see things more clearly. We are your people. We come before you with the offering of our lives. We know that we can trust you. And we ask you to continue to equip us for the work you've prepared in advance for us to do. Open our eyes this morning, we pray. And help us to have the mind of Christ and to discern the truth about ourselves and about you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you, Howard, for that uh, beautiful prayer and for the wonderful scenery that is in your garden, all that hard work that Anna does to make it so beautiful, and I'm sure you lend a hand when you can. But let's now come to God's Word together. We are continuing our series of Called and Equipped, and this morning we start another little section in that series We've looked at God's call to us as his choice uh, to himself. We've looked at some of the various ways that God, of what God calls each of us to do as part of what it means to follow him. And um, last time we did a little bit of a transition 
looking at some of the things that we need to consider when we're seeking to find God's will, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And in that last message, we highlighted the importance of following Jesus, to keep going to Jesus, to keep following him, to keep asking Jesus what he wants us to do, what he wants to say to us, what, who he wants us to be. And he will guide us and he will tell us through the person of the Holy Spirit. And what he tells us may be different to what he tells someone else, but it will always be in line with his word and with his good and perfect purpose. I've said this a few times now, but this lockdown period is an opportunity to reset ourselves before our Father, to learn again what it means or to learn afresh what it means to follow him, to love him, to do what he asks us to do and to take some time to listen to him, to immerse ourselves in the word and in prayer. And as he, we do that, we allow our minds to be renewed, transformed by the Holy Spirit and uh, so that we can know his good, pleasing and perfect will. Now, last time I suggested a few things that the renewed mind takes seriously when considering God's will for us. And this morning, we're going to start digging a, digging a little deeper into a couple of those things. We're going to start looking at this whole area of spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. So for the next few messages in the series, we're going to be spending quite a bit of time in 1 Corinthians 12 through to 14. Pastor Samuel McKibben once told me that he thanks the Lord for the Corinthians because they got so much wrong. And because they got so much wrong, it means that we can understand what it means to do things right. And he's got a very good point uh, there. Over 25 years ago, I remember doing a discipleship course in a church that I used to attend it was a course called Master Life and it was an excellent course. I learned and applied many things through that course. And one of the last parts of that course was to spend an evening seeking to understand what our spiritual gifts were or gifts. And there was about eight of us on the course and we went through the list of spiritual gifts that we read in places like 1 Corinthians 12, we, we went through them something like this. Word of wisdom. Mm, right, well, I struggle with common sense sometimes, so obviously it's not that. Uh, word of knowledge. Um, well, I've got no clue what's going on in people's minds, so it can't be that. Gift of faith. Right, yes, yeah, sure, I've got some faith, but it's not exactly up to the standard of the people that we read about in Hebrews chapter 11, so maybe it's not that. Uh, gift of healing. Uh, no, I'm not a doctor. Uh, gift of miraculous powers? No. Uh, gift of tongues? Uh, Glaswegian? Does that count? Uh, no, maybe not. Um, interpretation of tongues? Oh, well, I was never really very good at languages at school, so it can't be that. Apostle? No. Uh, prophet? No. Teacher? No. Helps? 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 Yes, I can help. I can help. I can help put the table and chairs out. I can um, serve tea and coffee. I can help in so many different ways. I must have the gift of helps. And um, in fact, all of us on that course had exactly the same gift. We all had the gift of helps. And imagine that. Eight people all on the same course seeking to discover their spiritual gift who all attended the same church, all discovering that they had the gift of helps on the same evening and we justified that by saying that the, the arm part of the body helps the hand and in fact all parts of the body help one another so helps that's what we must have and we laugh so much at this amazing coincidence I think we saw the absurdity of it all and when I think back on that time we didn't talk about spiritual gifts in the church that I attended. Uh, so when it came to that part in the discipleship course, we didn't understand them, we didn't understand how they operated, and they were presented to us in such a way that the Bible says that we all have one, so which one is it? 
Now back on the 16th of February, which seems an awful long time ago given the current situation, but just on the 16th of February, you may remember that Pastor Gordon McIntosh came and spoke to us in ICF and he came and he spoke on a subject uh, called Be a Pioneer and some of you may remember uh, that message. But he said this, and I'm paraphrasing a little, but he said this, to let the word of God generate a heart response that provokes us, challenges us and gives us the strength to do what he calls us to do. And if we are feeling settled in some areas, let's get into the word to be honest before him, to say in this area of my life, I feel a bit nervous. And he went on to say that there was one specific area that he felt the prompting of the Spirit wanting to highlight for us as a church and not to settle in, but to progress on in, in our journey with him. And then that was in the area of spiritual gifts. He said it was in the area of moving in a way we have not known before in the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I've been reflecting on what the Lord was saying to us in that and I think for some time, certainly as a local church and probably in the wider church, we have been aware of spiritual gifts with a desire to see them operate. But we've not really spoken about them or taught about them. Maybe we've become settled in them. Maybe because we don't really understand them. Maybe because we are nervous about it. We're good at talking to each other about what should be without actually doing anything about it. As Pastor Paul Howell said last week, we're very good at the declaration, but maybe not so good at the demonstration. So when the Apostle Paul starts talking about spiritual gifts, he starts by saying this in 1 Corinthians 12 verse 1, and we're going to be reading from that passage in a moment, but Paul starts it like this. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. So I would encourage us to come to this subject with an open heart, with a renewed mind, to move off of our settled position and see what God is calling us to and see if we can understand afresh the biblical understanding of spiritual gifts and how they are to operate and how they are manifest so that we can apply and move forward in a way that we have never known before in this area of the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. So let's just pray before we do that, shall we? Father, I just pray right now, Lord, that whatever we've been taught about spiritual gifts, Father, I pray now that you would just seal what is your truth. And Father, if we're nervous, if we're settled about spiritual gifts, Father, I pray that you would teach us and you would help us learn afresh what it is you are saying to us in this whole area of spiritual gifts in the body of Christ, that we may flow in what you have purposed for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's now turn to God's word and let's read together from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 1 through 14. And this morning, Margaret is going to read this for us. The reading today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. 
Now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between gifts, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one, just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptised by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Amen. Amen. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. I've heard numerous sermons on spiritual gifts. Many times I've been told that all of us have got a spiritual gift given by Jesus and we need to find out what that spiritual gift is. I've heard many sermons on what the spiritual gifts are. And there's a great temptation with spiritual gifts to launch into uh, verses like 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4 and then focus on verses 8 through 10. But we're not going to do that this morning because there's something really, really important concerning spiritual gifts that we need to look at first. And that is that spiritual gifts proclaim Jesus as Lord. According to verse 3, we cannot proclaim that Jesus is Lord without the Holy Spirit. Verse 4 says that there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. And as we go through verses 8 through 11, we see that there are a variety of gifts, but they are all by the same Spirit. So that same Spirit, according to verse 3, proclaims Jesus as Lord. David Pryor, in his commentary, says this, We need to remind ourselves of the pagan background from which most of the Corinthian Christians had been delivered from. It was essentially based in the Greek mystery religious in which spiritual experiences were the norm. They had grown accustomed to being moved by some kind of supernatural or demonic force, either into a state of trance or into ecstasy or into some strange course of action. So what Paul is saying here in verses 1 to 3 is elementary but crucial. Whatever other spirits, whatever uh, divinities or uh, demons the Corinthians had previously encountered, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is committed to proclaiming that Jesus Christ is Lord. And this is key concerning spiritual gifts. The Spirit of God, the one true God, lifts up Jesus as Lord, glorifies Jesus, as Jesus himself said in John, 14, uh, John 16 verse 14, he, that is the Spirit, will glorify me, Jesus, because it is from me, Jesus, that he, the Spirit, will receive what he, the Spirit, will make known to you, us. When we talk about spiritual gifts, we often have a tendency to speak in a rather possessive way. We talk about my gift, my spiritual gift. Whereas scripture teaches us um, here in 1 Corinthians 12 and elsewhere that they're not your gift. They're not your gift. They are God's gift to the body by the Spirit of God for the purpose of establishing Jesus Christ as Lord because the Spirit of God is committed to glorifying, proclaiming, lifting high Jesus as Lord. 
Let me give you an example. Let's take the story of Ananias and Sapphira that we read in Acts chapter 5. This story illustrates how the Holy Spirit equipped a particular believer, Peter, with a specific gift, the word of knowledge, to deal with a clear situation which might never have been known, let alone dealt with, except by such a manifestation of the Spirit. Without this particular equipping of the Spirit, the church would have gradually lost its distinctive hallmark of integrity and transparency. Hypocrisy would have become normal in early Christian church. It begs a question regarding today's church. The result of this particular gift being firmly exercised in an extraordinary way was that, listen to this, this is in Acts chapter 5, that great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Many signs and wonders were done among the people by the hands of the apostles. More than ever, believers were added to the Lord. Every day in the temple and at home, the apostles did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. In other words, the Lordship of Jesus was asserted. We tend to promote people that have a particular spiritual gift. But that's not what spiritual gifts are about. The outcome wasn't the drawing of attention to Peter's gift. It wasn't Peter holding meetings where he conducted a, a word of knowledge ministry. It wasn't churches giving Peter an invitation to come and minister in the word of knowledge in their particular church. That's not what the outcome was. The outcome was the Lordship of Jesus. Because whose church is it? It's Jesus' church. As Colossians 1.18 says, And he, speaking of Jesus, is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy, including in the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit as given to members of his body, which he is head of, which he is the beginning of, which he is the firstborn from among the dead of. So when we begin to look afresh at spiritual gifts, this always has to be in the forefront of our minds, that spiritual gifts are not given primarily for us to promote us they are primarily given to us so that in the exercising of them we are proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord that's the first thing that Peter says about spiritual gifts secondly he says this spiritual gifts are for the common good we see this in verses four through seven where Paul gives an overview of the essential nature of how spiritual gifts are given and how they are to operate. Now, we know in the church that there is a variety of people and gifts. Um, there are many members of the body. Each member is different. No person, no gift is a replica of another. David Pryor again says in his commentary, any desire or effort to extinguish or diminish this rich diversity is not inspired by the Holy Spirit. And there is a focus throughout chapter 12, if you look through chapter 12, that illustrates God's sovereign action in his church in relation to this diversity of people and gifts. Verse 11 says that God appointed, or sorry, sorry, God apportioned or distributed to each one. Verse 18 says God arranged or placed in the body. Verse 24 said God composed or put the body together. Verse 28 says that God appointed in the church. God gives to his church both gifts and people. The emphasis being in all of this that God is in control. From beginning to end, from the smallest detail to the broad scope of church life, God is in control. Jesus is building his church. And one of the ways he does that is through the distribution of spiritual gifts to the body. And this is how he does it. Verse 4. God 
distributes the gift. There are different kinds of gift, but the same spirit distributes them. These are the charismata of gifts, gifts of grace that are given to us. The modern Greek word means birthday present. So it's like a love gift from Jesus. A gift, rightly, we don't deserve, but God in his love and in his grace gives us this gift. And that implies that the gift is for, uh, is for us to be enjoyed. It's for the enjoyment of the receiver. And that is true in one sense. But we cannot stop there because, um, well, it's true in one sense, because God will not give us a gift that we won't benefit from, that we won't enjoy. God won't give us bad gifts. He'll give us good gifts. And that's true in one sense, but we have to move on because it says in verse 5 that there are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. Here we get an understanding that the gift of grace given to us is not just for us. It's to be used in service to the Lord. As 1 Peter 4.10 says, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And that attitude of mind points supremely to Jesus being Lord of our lives because we are seeking to serve him through serving others. But we move on, verse 6. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. God is at work in a variety of ways, but it is all God at work. He never slumbers and he never sleeps. How dare we limit God to working in ways that we don't understand? The scripture says that his ways are higher than our ways. It says that he moves in mysterious ways. The gifts of the Spirit are given to us for serving others and they are outworked in a whole host of different ways and then just in case we miss the point verse 7 is given now to each one the manifestation of the spirit is given for the common good this is how the message puts it verses 6 and 7 it's god's varied various expressions of power are in action everywhere but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. I love that. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. Is God's energy, is his spirit within us, are his gifts given to us limited only to the church? No, I don't think they are. They are for the common good. The gifts of the Spirit are God's work in us spilling out into the life of both the church and the community. They are for the common good. Christians are to live a lifestyle of worship and in so doing so demonstrate that they have the spirit of God within them. God intends to make himself known through his gifts to his people and through the fruit that he produces in their lives. Again to quote David Pryor, so in the context of spiritual gifts then the spirit of God underwrites and spells out the fundamental fact that Jesus is Lord by embodying his presence in the world in a variety of ways through each individual member of his body, but always pointing to Jesus as Lord. And this draws me to our third point to make today, that spiritual gifts are for each member of the body. Verses 12 through 14, Paul emphasises it actually in verse 7. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given. Each one means each one, means everyone, every member of the body, every individual 
in the body. Each one means each one. That means you, if you're a member of his body, you're one. <laughs> you're given a gift. The phrase the body perfectly describes, doesn't it? These two themes of diversity and unity. Many members, one body. The way Paul ends verse 12, I think, is very significant. You know, we might expect Paul to say, just as one, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with the church. But he doesn't say that. He says, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. This is because the way Christ manifests himself by the Spirit to the world is through his body, is through the church. And Christ is the head of the church. He is the one that is directing the body and he gives to his body both gifts and people. We need to get away from this mentality that we are a body in a physical sense. So get away from this mentality, oh, I must, I, I, I'm a foot, so I can never be an ear, or once a foot, always a foot. That, we need to get away from that type of mentality. Christ's body is a spiritual body. We are living stones. This means that we're not stuck in one place all the time by cement. That's not what we were called to be. But we're called to be living stones, moving, listening, speaking, performing actions. We are, as 1 Peter 2, 5 says, living stones being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Christ gives gifts to members of his body. As verse 11 says, he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Like Peter, given the word of knowledge for a specific situation to proclaim the lordship of Jesus that otherwise would have been lost. Like Peter again in Acts chapter 3, who received the gift of faith and maybe even the gift of healing and maybe even the gift of miracles to believe that the lame beggar in the community would be able to walk. And the result of that was that people were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to the lame man, which opened the door of opportunity of Peter to proclaim the gospel, which led to many people being saved in other words, it proclaimed the Lordship of Jesus. And God can use each one of us in a variety of ways if we are open to his will. He can use each of us as he determines to bring about proclamation of Jesus Christ being Lord. Like he used a cleaner in a hospital to minister to someone suffering terribly from COVID-19. But God used that cleaner to minister in life into that man. And that man's testimony went all over social media. God used a cleaner in a particular time, in a particular place. God gave him a gift and he used that gift to serve someone else. And God demonstrated his power and Jesus received all the glory. And we need to get away from this mentality of what gift do I have? We need to get away from talking about spiritual gifts in this rather possessive way. And we need to start talking about them in the context of being open to his will as he determines, as part of his body that demonstrates his lordship. Spiritual gifts are not just for operation on a Sunday morning service. They're not even just for operation within the confides of church. But they are given for the common good because the body of Christ are seeking to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord every day, in every place, in every situation. And Paul is emphasising here is that each of us 
Each one of us who are part of his body have a part to play in proclaiming that lordship of Jesus through the operation of gifts that God has distributed, that God has placed, that God has composed, that God has appointed in his church. God has not only given you a gift, he's placed you in the body he, that he has put together and that he has appointed you to operate in that gift. And as all of us together do that with what Jesus has given us and where he has placed us, then we together proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Because it's not about the individual. It's about the body and how he has constructed us for the praise of his glory. And I believe that firmly when it comes to a local body of his people. But I also believe that in the context of the wider church community. We are living stones. And sometimes God moves us from one place to another. But we're still part of his body. Sometimes God moves us from one uh, role in a local church to a different role in a local church. But we're all still part of his body. We are living stones. Because in all of it, we have to believe that God is in control because he is the one building his church. Not us. He is building his church. We all have a part to play in proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord by the Spirit of God. Because all of us have been given a gift by that same Spirit. A gift that we benefit from but that serves others in a whole variety of different ways for the common good. So that it's Jesus that gets all the praise and all the glory. So in conclusion, I don't know what you think about spiritual gifts. I don't know what teaching you've had on spiritual gifts in the past. Maybe a lot of it is focused on the gifts themselves. To understand the gifts in order to identify what gift it is that you have. I know that's certainly the case in, in my background. But this morning, I just get a sense to lift our eyes to the giver of gifts. To Jesus. To lift our hearts to him as members of his body and no matter where you are today or what local body you fellowship in let's lift our hearts to him and seek as individuals in his body seek his lordship because it's not about the gift but it's about what God does through us using the gift that he gives us for him in serving him in whatever way for the common good and that outcome is proclaiming Jesus Christ as Lord God has distributed God has placed God has composed God has appointed gifts and people in the body our role as members of his body, is to be a living stone, following the living stone, loving him, doing what he asks, listening to what he says, and always striving to perform his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And his gifts to us are a part of what he equips us with to do just that so once more let's surrender to him let's yield our lives before him and say Lord whatever you want of me to serve others in whatever way let me be the vessel of your power in order that you are proclaimed as Lord God bless you Amen 
Amen. Thank you for that, Robbie. May we all be open to be used for his glory. Thank you for joining with us and our ICF service. I would like to just encourage you to read through your emails that we send out on a Tuesday and a Thursday. It's good to get connected in and see what's happening in all the different Zoom sessions that we have through the week. If you are not connected in with ICF and would like to know more information about us, then you can have a look on our website, which you will see on the screen now. I would just like to close by reading a blessing that um, Pastor Stuart Wood had shared on his Facebook page this week. So let's pray together. May his favour be upon you and thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you. He is with you. He is with you. In the morning, in the evening, in your coming and your going, in your weeping and rejoicing, he is for you. He is for you. Amen. <laughs>